They once called it King Coal. For more than a century, it powered a nation. People don't believe it. They cannot imagine how important this industry was. It offered work and demanded sacrifice. The blast knocked me down. I've never heard men scream like that. It created communities and divided them. Now those same communities are fighting to preserve its legacy for everyone. This is the story of mining communities told through their art. We start with paintings. Visitors to the National Mining Museum here in Yorkshire are often surprised that this dark, dirty and often brutal industry has such a rich connection with art. On canvas, miners found a way of expressing the danger, despair and the camaraderie that they experienced underground. The so-called Pittman painters, Geordie miners, who discovered art during evening classes in the 1930s, became famous and even inspired a West End play. But I'm here to find out more about a man who's been described as Derbyshire's forgotten Pittman painter, George Bissell. Bissell was a true pioneer. Well before the Pittman painters even picked up a paintbrush, his muscle-bound miners graphically conveyed the claustrophobia of the coalface in oil and woodcut. This gives people a real insight into what that experience was like. He's incredibly important and should be recognised for the achievements that, that he made. Everybody off, mind your step, mind your this way, please. So where did George Bissell find inspiration for his art? I'm heading into the dark depths of Cap House Colliery at the National Coal Mining Museum to see what life was like for him and so many others. So is this what it would have been like 100 years ago? Certainly would. In 1909, Bissell followed his father down the pit in Langley Mill. He was just 13 years old. And again. Oh, yeah. Have a good swing. God, it's That's really it. tough, isn't it? We know George hated this work, and I can see why. Kate, being here in the mine, you can really see why it made such an impact on George. Yes, uh, uh, for a 13 or 14 year old boy coming down here, you and I know that we're going to go up to the surface soon. But for him, a 12-hour shift down here would have been terrible. He was a sensitive and artistic child. It was a terrible experience for him. And yet, what he saw here was the subject matter of his work for the rest of his life. In 1915, George escaped the mine by volunteering to fight in the First World War. But it wasn't the change of scene he'd been hoping for. In fact, as soon as it was discovered that he'd been a miner, he was sent back underground to be a sapper. The sapper's job was to tunnel towards no man's land and lay bombs under the enemy. He had some terrible experiences there. He was in a, a fall which buried him alive for three hours. And he was gassed and uh, invalided home eventually. Yet what George went through inspired a prodigious outpouring of artistic work, some of it now held here at the National Coal Mining Museum. Yes. It's one of three art stores that we have on site at the museum. Should we have a look? Yes. These are our framed works, so we've got a mixture of paintings and ink drawings. We also have a poster in the collection and several of his woodcuts. Oh, they're stunning, aren't they? It just makes such a, a strong impact, though, because the images are really bold, aren't they? They are, and I think also the scale in which he created the figures. They're quite monumental when you look at the size of them in the space in which they're captured. And I think that was a very deliberate statement by Bissell, because here's somebody who's actually putting his own personal feelings about his experiences of working underground into his work. That sense of claustrophobia really comes through, doesn't it? 
lot of our visitors that come and see this work and they don't know anything about him and lots of former miners will look at it and they'll say, but that's no miner I ever saw, you know, miners didn't look like that. But again, he's making a very deliberate statement here. In very few of his pictures did he ever really draw any detailed features of the miners' faces. And again, you know, that seems to be a kind of almost a deliberate statement about the dehumanised nature of mining at that period in time. I have this theory that lots of miners who became artists, whether that was professional or amateur, almost used art as a, as a form of therapy. Mining was in his heart and he wanted to always remember what he saw down here. For a short while in the 1920s, George Bissell's art found a wider audience. He was the toast of the art world. These headlines in the papers show just how celebrated he was. Yes. I mean, this one, fame for artist minor. And that was the Daily Express, the Sunday Express, art dreams in a coal pit. Minor artist led to fame by his visions. I do like this one, which was a local paper, the Nottingham Evening News, and it says, from the pick to the palette, a Langley Mill miner's art success, fight against the odds. There was a real sense of a, a rag to riches story, wasn't there? But it, there in, was. in terms of an artist. Yes. He never lost that zeal for letting people know what conditions were like underground. He could have been Langley Mills' most famous son, but George's hometown shunned his work. When he created a set of murals for a local school, they were rejected. The governors called them indecent. Over the years, George Bissell's fame faded and he died in 1973, largely forgotten. Well, this is where the young George Bissell lived, 45 Ebenezer Street here in Langley Mill. But don't go looking for a blue plaque, a statue or a memorial, because you won't find one, which is rather sad. Around the time George Bissell's work was being shown, the first high-quality photographs of life underground were being captured on camera. And we've come across this rare set of amazing magic lantern slides that were on the brink of being lost forever. Life underground at the coalface, photographed nearly a century ago. The rescue story for these images starts with a former miner. David Amos's family dug coal for seven generations. What well, a bit more like that, down there, we'll leave the chicken down for you. These days you'll find David burrowing around in lofts, cellars and sheds searching for mining memorabilia. He's now a revered academic historian and always on the lookout for buried treasure. One winter's night, David got a tip-off about a curious old wooden box discovered during a house clearance. Straight away, what I did, I realised the significance when he described them, and I went straight down to his house. The treasure hunt took him to the old pit village of Blidworth in Nottinghamshire. These were rung up about, Dave, and I think you'll be honest delighted with them, I don't know, but... The box of 24 glass slides was in immaculate condition and the images were stunning. Just him under here, under here, under cutting coal. Yeah, but look at the crack going right down, look, <laughs> right from the top down to there, look. Fortunately, Terry Cottam, a keen photographer, had realised the value and rarity of the slides, unlike the man clearing the house. My cousin said to me, do you want to take them to the camera club? I said, I said what do you want to do with them? He says, well, if nobody wants them, they're going in the skip. I said, you're joking. Well, if it, if it goes in the skip, future generations will never know where a coal mine is. They don't no. have them now, do they? So no. they, they don't even know how they went on it. I mean, I didn't know. In the 1950s, there were safety films with simple, clumsy messages for new recruits to the coalface. Well, his safety helmet saved him, but he should have been looking where he was going. 
And it's thought these slides, many showing Besswood Colliery in Nottingham in the 1930s, might also have been shot for a training manual. They also vividly illustrate the pecking order at the pit. There's a classic one with a colliery official stood with the, the stick, the lamp, a waistcoat on and a, a prominent beard like D.H. Lawrence's dad would have, Arthur Lawrence, along with two colliers at the side of him undercutting the coal. The hierarchy in mining is quite obvious. It's all part of the story of, of coal. I mean, I often quote to people the, the, the history of these islands which we live in. There wouldn't be a lot of it without cotton and coal. <laughs> It's amazing that these slides have survived so well. This glass, from what I can remember, was thinner than greenhouse glass. And if you, if you dropped it into the processing tray, a bit sharpish, it would crack. Michael should know, for his entire working life, he was a coal board photographer. He's in awe of the pictures and the men who took them. It must have been a monumental task taking them in those days for these guys to go down there and maybe with a 10 by 8 plate camera as well, which would be huge with big heavy wooden tripods as well. So it must have been a difficult task. Yeah, I think they are absolutely amazing. If you look at him at back, look, he looks like he's done some work, doesn't he? <laughs> him in the middle at back, but the other two don't, do they? In the past, these pictures would have been shown by flickering candlelight at a magic lantern show. Today, former miners and their wives have gathered for a 21st century version using a projector and laptop. So it's taken us back a long, long time. I really enjoyed it. You don't realise, in 1930, what the workmen did. They got no hats on, have they? That's what we noticed, they got no hats on. No, just bare hands, no gloves. It makes you think about the old grandfathers years ago, how they struggled. And when we worked there, it was much easier in our day than it was their day. I hated my husband when he worked at the pit. I, I didn't want him to go down. I didn't want him to go down. I thought it was too dangerous. Is it going to be one of the best ways that future generations can understand the hardship as well as the camaraderie that these miners uh, lived in, in the pits? Fast forward half a century and pictures of hardship become news images of protests. When Margaret Thatcher announced the closure of most of the country's mines, most miners, led by Arthur Scargill, went on strike. But the community was divided. Back in 1984, at the height of the miners' strike, this road, Berry Hill in Mansfield, witnessed fierce confrontations. It was home to the breakaway Union of Democratic Mine Workers, who defied the strike call. If every Nottinghamshire miner would support this union... Over 30 years later, there was more frenzied activity here as researchers raced to save valuable artefacts from the old UDM headquarters before it was demolished to make way for these new homes. And what they found astounded them. We were rooting around underneath the stage. It was very dirty and dusty. We were there with torches. We had an idea that there might be something interesting under there. And what we found were 12 mining banners. Some of them were in disrepair, but it was really exciting to see, you know, the colours and the images and all that, and, and see the names of the, of the places. And it was just a, a fantastic find, really, because it, it, it was kind of connected to our heritage, so it, it really meant something. You know, these banners had been placed, they'd been marched at galas and all that kind of thing, so they were to do with the people, really. They symbolise working-class solidarity the importance of coal mines to the locality and to the nation. I declare the festival of Pitten open. 
In 1951, the Festival of Britain celebrated the nation's industry, arts and science, heralding a better Britain. And the miners' banners mirrored this mood. This is the Festival of Britain, which is depicting the post-war era where Britain was the workshop of the world. Well, this, this depicts Mansfield. And it's Mansfield Collar in the centre and the coal that's playing the central role in powering the nation, hence the power station, the ships and the coal and the railways. Often these banners can be the only surviving bits of evidence of long forgotten social history. Saved from the skip, the banners are now stored safely and used for special occasions and galas. But for some, they're still a painful reminder of bitterness and division. This banner was produced by the UDM. It can be incredibly difficult for you, can't it, to show this banner? And there, are there some places where you simply can't? No, well, there's certain parts you, you wouldn't uh, be able to go in certain parts of Britain with this, because there'd be that much abuse and that. So, yeah, so you have to be very careful that, um, you know, the, the arguments are still ongoing from that, from the, the split in 1984. What could potentially happen if you showed this in, in the wrong place? Well, the, the worst thing could probably happen was that it would get damaged mm. or even, you know, totally destroyed. These well-worn and weathered banners are much more than just coloured thread and cloth. As one of the research team who discovered these banners put it, they're like the tattered military colours you sometimes see hanging in cathedrals, potent symbols of battles won and lost. But it's not just old artefacts that link us to our heritage. New art can connect us to the past too, even the history we might prefer to forget. There must be hundreds of statues commemorating the coal age across the country, like this striking bronze figure clutching a Davy lamp at Teversal. It's called Testing for Gas and it sits on the highest point in Nottinghamshire. All too often, it's the human cost of extracting coal from the earth that these statues commemorate. The figures carved in wood emerging from the ground here at Brawley Country Park mark a truly horrific disaster at Sutton Colliery. It happened over 60 years ago on the 21st of February 1957. At around 11.30 in the morning, sirens began sounding here in the villages above Sutton Pit, just a few miles from Mansfield. On that day, 40 men had clocked in for work. A massive stone measuring around a metre fell off the roof of the pit. It created a spark which caused an explosion, and then a fireball ripped through the shaft. In scenes strikingly similar to Ken Loach's drama, The Price of Coal, the miners caught in the blast faced absolute terror. It was so sudden. A rush of wind like a sandstorm, very fierce, knocked me down from off my knees to a lying position. There was a roar and like a flamethrower came after. That went right through the face. It was so thick with dust and fumes, it was difficult to see, although my, still, my light still worked. It must have been terrifying. Yeah. I did hear, that I mean, men were screaming. I never heard men scream like that. George, who's 90 years old, was badly burned and lost an eye in the blast. Five men died and 25 suffered serious injuries. George may be the last living victim of the blast, but Bob Bradley, then a young coal board inspector, witnessed the aftermath. Well, when we arrived, it was complete mayhem. Things were blown all over the place, you could tell that. There was burnt clothing burnt wood, lots of dust, water bottles and stuff like that were strewn about, pit helmets. What could you see? What was the it like as you descended into the pit? Horrible burning flesh. Very difficult to describe unless you smelt it yourself. 
the under manager had 12 months facial operations to put his face back together again. The statues are solemn reminders of the Sutton disaster, but Malcolm Godbert will never be able to forget that day. He was at work down the pit, some distance from the explosion, but his 16-year-old brother John, operating the conveyor belt, was caught by the full force of the blast and died in hospital. Rest in peace, Johnny. Rest in peace. It shouldn't have been there because simply why, that was my job. Driving that conveyor belt, that was my regular job. Well, it's been on my mind for years. It ought to be me. Instead of our children. It's been playing on my mind all while. I look at this photo every night when I'm going to bed. It didn't have a chance to live, and that was on my mind. I lost his life. You still remember, you never forget. Did you ever go back to work in the pit after this happened? No, no. I couldn't bring myself to, to do that. I hadn't got the courage to do it. I just couldn't face that again. In East Sussex, down a muddy track in a former cow shed, Robert Koenig took those memories and turned them into a piece of sculpture. I carved five figures of miners emerging from the ground, but they represent all the, the miners who went down there, and there were many, and, uh, and they had all sorts of dramatic events happening to them. But the, they also symbolise the five miners who were killed in the mining disaster. So it's not just those that died, but all their colleagues who worked so hard, risking their lives deep in the earth. This is a really powerful theme for me, to deal with uh, this theme, these people, the miners who went down. These figures, spirits of these miners, I wanted them to be look as if they're gradually climbing out. The last miners to leave the pit before it closed, that is really a, a dramatic and emotional event. Sutton Pit closed in 1989. No one was ever brought to book for the 1957 disaster, but there's always been a suspicion that safety was put at risk in pursuit of productivity. It was a nasty pit. I should say it was one of the worst in the area. There was all short of materials. People complained, but it made no difference. I blame the uh, manager. He was a, a ruthless man for cutting corners and demanding more and more coal. And in the process of doing that, neglected other things. I think it's very important to have the sculptures and to remind people that people gave their lives for getting coal. from art to architecture, and a reminder that King Cole had his palaces. This is Plesley Pit in Derbyshire. It closed down in 1983 after running for more than 100 years. It's a very special coal mine, a real architectural gem, but it came very close to being demolished and being swept away from the landscape. After Plesley closed, the site lay derelict, awaiting demolition, until heritage enthusiast Bob Metcalf stumbled across it on a day out. I found Plesley Colliery, which was abandoned, crawled through the hole in the fence, 
crawled through the hole in the wall and found these magnificent sleeping giants. There was no roof, uh, a very large collection of pigeons doing what pigeons do. There were trees actually growing out of the, out of the engine. Uh, it was dreadful. Campaigners raced against the clock to get a preservation order on the site. It was an 11th hour saving, yes, because the, the coal board was dismantling everything. They took all the, it was a vast site. There followed major restoration work on the roof, windows, chimney and the giant headstocks. Well, this building we're standing in is a listed building, so it's of special architectural interest. And it's got these great sort of chapel-like windows here, and it's a great sort of lofty space. People might be surprised to learn it's also a scheduled ancient monument. Now, Stonehenge is a scheduled monument. A Roman fort is a scheduled monument. Iron Age hill forts are scheduled monuments. There's actually fewer of sites like this than there are of those sites. There's been lottery heritage fund money, but it's the volunteers who've really brought this building and its two engines back to life. Oh, it's magic, absolutely magic. It's like having a big toy box, a very big toy box, something that you, you can really sort of get involved in. Some of the engine parts were missing and turned up in unusual places. This, which is the governor, it ended up in Islington in London. It's a garden ornament, would you believe? We were invited to go and fetch it, only to find out that we couldn't get it out of the garden without dragging it through the house. And we did that across the shag pile carpet and the strategically placed Ming vases. And we brought it back up here and put it straight back onto its position on the floor. Now Plesley is open to the public and attracting visitors from all over the world. We get a lot of Particularly school children now get lots of school visits and the children come and they don't know what coal is, never mind what a coal mine is. People don't believe it. They come to places like this, they cannot conceive, they cannot imagine how important this industry was. You know, one in ten people were employed in the coal mining industry at the start of the 20th century. This pit worked for over 100 years and that will tell you how many generations of miners have worked here and put money into the local economy. To actually have sites like this remaining that reflect the coal mining industry is tremendously important. Otherwise, you've just erased that history from the landscape. The designers had a pride here. You can see that. They didn't want to throw up just a tin shed. They were throwing up something that had permanence that reflected the importance of the industry. As far as they knew, it was going to be here forever. We are trying to continue um, the sort of traditions of the mining industry. And, uh, and they always want to, to do hard, dirty work, so we, we, we just continue. I mean, a lot of the volunteers here feel that they're still working at the pit. <laughs> they called it King Coal, but go searching for its history and you'll find a world of caps, not crowns, pits, not palaces, communities, not courtiers. And thanks to the people fighting to preserve our past, you will find that history. It's all around us.